that we have the call recording going and uh, everybody's logging in, uh, we'll get started. Today, we're going to talk about the seven critical IT security protection every business must have in place now. We're really going to go in and explain and talk about IT security in general, why it's important, why you need to take it seriously, and what we could do. Uh, all right, let's get let's get going. Uh, so, what are we going to cover today? Uh, first thing we're going to cover is uh, the number one security threat to your business that antivirus, firewalls, and other security pr protocols cannot protect you against. I'm not going to tell you what it is now. I'll tell you when we get to it. But think about it. And what what is the number one security threat out there? Uh, then a shocking truth about bank fraud that most businesses don't know about that could literally wipe out your bank account. We're going to talk about bank fraud specifically, and we're going to talk about why firewalls, antivirus, uh, antivirus software aren't enough anymore, and what else we need to do, and how mobile phones and cloud applications are seriously jeopardizing your organization's security and data protection. Just because you're in the cloud doesn't mean that you're protected. doesn't mean that it has all the security measures in place. Uh, Office 365, for instance, doesn't mean it's backed up and doesn't mean it has the security measures to make sure that your, your data doesn't get out there and what you need to do to protect yourself. Uh, you know, ultimately, we're going to cover how to avoid being a sitting duck to cyber criminals and uh, protect everything you've worked so hard to achieve. Um, so this is what we're going to get into. Uh, we're going to show you what you need to do now to be able to sleep better at night knowing that your data is secure and uh, that you are compliant. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself first. This is me. My name is Ikram Massabini. I'm the CEO of MVP Network Consulting. I have a bachelor's uh, degree in electronic engineering. Uh, over 17 years of healthcare IT uh, and security. I'm a I'm, I'm certified security consultant. I have many IT certifications, um, and I'm a HIPAA consultant and an auditor. Uh, and we I focus on the security side of IT. Uh, and uh, I will hopefully uh, you'll get some benefit from some of the information that I've learned throughout the years and I've put in this presentation. Uh, so to get started, this gentleman here is the former CEO of Intel, and he said success breeds compl complacency, and complacency breeds failure. Only the paranoid shall survive. I'm not saying you need to be paranoid, but you need to do some stuff internally that's usually easy to do to protect your environment. Uh, Trend Micro, which is a big security company, called 2016 will be the year of online extortion, and they were right. 2017 is actually beating 2016 in, in online extortion side of things. So let's talk about cybercrime business uh, in general. Sorry about that. Uh, but so this is a business. Cybercrime is a business, and we call it cybercrime business because they generate a lot of dollars and a lot of profit. Uh, it's, it's, you, you want to stress, it's the idea that it's a cyber crime ring, really. Uh, these people go to work nine to five. These people stand in front of a computer and their job is to try to hack you and get your data so that they can make money off of it. So the evolution of crime, really, in the old days, the cyber crime, before the cyber crime business was pretty simple. You bought a gun or a knife, uh, you hid out in a dark alley, and when somebody would walk by, you'd jump out and say, stick them up and uh, take their money. Uh, startup costs and overhead were low, and uh, you didn't get caught. Uh, and if you didn't get caught, you'd be OK. But of course, just like any business owner, criminals uh, were thinking bigger, and they wanted to grow. So how can they grow that business? So what technology answered that question. Uh, first, trains came along. And instead of robbing one person at a time, they can stop a train and rob three to 400 people at a time. Uh, and robbing trains were far more lucrative because you caught a bunch of people at the same time. Think of it that way, that now it's a kind of like a train robbery, except it's from a, instead of three, 400 people, it's 30,000 records. It's two point some million people at the same time that you're able to go rob their info and sell it on the black market to make money off of it. It's a, it's a crime. It's very hard to detect and, and catch, but you could protect yourself against it. And we're going to talk about that. 
So thanks to today's advancement in technology and ever-increasing trend of storing financial and personal information on third-party cloud platforms, the new train robberies are cybercrime uh, related. Uh, so that's, that's what's happening. Uh, for example, uh, 80 million households and 7 million small businesses were hacked. That came from J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, why do they hack you and what do they want from you? Well, if they get that information, they can sell it on the black market. So a credit card detail goes between $2 and $90 on the black market. An iTunes account is about eight bucks. Physical credit card is $190 on the black market. A card cloner that you could buy is between $200 to $300. Uh, fake ATMs are $35,000. Uh, records for uh, healthcare records can be sold for up to 200 bucks. It is, a money maker they get your data to sell it that's all they are they care for they care for they care about making money it's a business so one can any anyone can easily buy training uh, training or tools and services just to commit fraud and hack systems and buy stolen credit card information and what have you but a lot of people tell us we're still small. I mean, why would they come after us? They usually would go after somebody that have a lot more record than us. We only have three, 4,000 records. What's just wrong, completely wrong. The idea here is one in five small businesses fall victim to cyber crime each and every year, and that number continues to grow. And small businesses are low hanging fruit because they don't believe that they're a target, so they don't do all the stuff that they need to do. And these are easy stuff that should be done, uh, but it needs to be done to make them not the low-hanging fruit anymore, to make them harder to get in. Criminals are as lazy as everybody else, and what they do is if it's easy to get there, they'll go after you. If it's hard to get there, they'll go after somebody easier first. Um, so half of all cyber attacks are aimed to small and medium-sized businesses because they're so easy to break into. So 201, uh, this number, what, what does this number reveal is really, uh, this number is the num the cost per record if you're a healthcare organization that will cost you per record if uh, you uh, you get hacked. Not only does it cost you $201 because of reputation reputation damage, or it will also cost you loss of clients, uh, lawsuits, class action lawsuits, and individual lawsuits will come against you because you lost their data, legal fees you have to incur, compliance lawsuits. Uh, replacement of data, downtime, loss, productivity. The key point here is just because you're a small business, that doesn't mean your customer's information is any less valuable to them. You are doing what you are doing. Uh, what you are doing to be a good steward for their information. What are you doing to be a good steward for their information? What are you doing internally to make sure that not only is your data secure, but the data that you're housing for your clients is secure? Uh, and we're going to get into the detail of this. I just wanted to put it out there so that everybody thinks about uh, security. Everybody thinks about how important that is. Some of you may have been hacked already. So there is uh, 82,000 new malware threats that are being released every single day. Think about that number. 99% of all computers are vulnerable to exploit kits. 99% of them. You think you fall in that 1% or do you think you are vulnerable as well? So the number one issue that we talked about is your end users. The number one threat to your security altogether is your end users. They're careless insiders. Three different types of end users, if you will. I broke them down that way. Either careless insiders may simply press the wrong key and accidentally delete or modify any critical information. They're just careless. They're not paying attention. They're clicking everywhere that they they shouldn't be clicking, going online, watching videos or what have you that may have some malicious code in it. Uh, the number two is because you have an exploited insider. That's somebody that may be tricked by an external parties to click on something. Or you have a malicious person internally. Uh, these are the least frequent ones, but have the potential to cause the most significant damage because if they're malicious and they work for your organization, they may want to delete something. They may want to see something that you may not want them to. They may share your information outside that, uh, in a way that you don't want them to. Uh, 90, end users are responsible for 95% of all data breaches. I'm going to tell you what we could do for end users to make sure that they are, they are no longer a threat, which is really training. If you train your end user properly, 
they will understand what to look for when they are online and they will not uh, be as much of a threat as they are right now. The second thing is spam. Spam remains the biggest drivers for big breaches today. If we look at some of the biggest data breaches in recent memory, JP Morgan and Target, RSA Security, they all came uh, because of a spam. ECMC, locally here in Buffalo, who spent $10 million because of a, uh, it happened, it started with a spam, spam message. And somebody clicked on it that activated a ransomware and they were held hostage and all the data that they own could not be accessed anymore. As a matter of fact, they're still in recovery. So spam is very important. There's all different types of spam attacks, something like like jacking or link jacking or phishing or social spamming. These are basically like jacking is if you go to a, a Facebook, a fake Facebook page that has a like button and you say, oh, I like this article, let me click on it. And when you click on it, it actually downloads something to your machine. So you've got to be aware of where you're clicking. Are you within Facebook or are you on a, another page that has its own Facebook button? That's really not a true like button. Or a link jacking. This is a, a practice used to redirect one's website to another website that's being uh, maintained by a hacker. Or phishing is a phishing email that you get information in that you click on. And social, social spam is unwanted spam content appearing on social networks. So there's all different types of spam attacks that's still happening. And you've got to be aware of them. Now that goes hand in hand with employees because spam is one thing. But clicking on something that comes to you happens from an employee. Again, 95% of all attacks happen because your employees just don't know any better. And if we train them properly, we are able to stop a lot of the uh, issues from happening. But you also need to protect your network. Um, the, second, the third danger is ransomware. Uh, a lot of more people are talking uh, more and more about ransomware. Ransomware is a sort of a virus, but it's not a virus. It's a a piece of software that gets downloaded onto your workstation and uh, or any device on your network. And what it does is it encrypts all your data. And once it encrypts your data and is done encrypting it, that's what exactly what happened at ACMC. And you double click on one of your files, this message right here in red will appear. This is the crypto locker message, one of the many variation of ransomware out there. And it'll basically tell you you need to pay 100 US dollar, 100 euros in Bitcoin for them to decrypt your data or you will lose all your data. And it puts a timer. And after that timer is done, your data is gone forever. The way ransomware works is um, through five different steps. So it takes a while for ransomware to be active. You may have it for a while before it becomes active. First, an installation has to happen. Then they have to contact headquarters to let them know that they actually got installed. And headquarters has to say, all right, now that you got installed, I'm going to send you the keys, the encryption keys to encrypt all the files. Then encryption happens. Then the extortion happens. All these steps have to happen before you get affected. If you have some tools in place, it will stop that from happening first. So that there is different ways for us to stop it. So ransomware, it holds your data or system for ransom. It doesn't discriminate. Uh, and often impossible to, to reverse. It's hard to track uh, online due to P2P and the dark web, and uh, hard to track financially because it's Bitcoin. Uh, ransomware, nearly 50% of all businesses experienced a ransomware infection in the last year. 53% of all businesses experienced, almost experienced it. One to five is 41%. Some people received it more than 20%. This is the 1%. But however, more, nearly 50% of businesses got ransomware. Ransomware collected over a billion dollars from January 2015 to April 2016 in the United States alone. A billion dollars uh, of hijacking uh, people's data. It's a criminal, criminal act. Uh, and the way that that goes through is something like social engineering or phishing macros. I put a picture of a macro what that looks like. So let's say you're watching a, a video on YouTube or you're watching a video online somewhere. And as you're watching it, somebody embedded malicious code within the video. So as you're watching the video and you don't know anything is happening, that code gets, it jumps in, in one piece in your RAM, in your memory to another piece, and then they have access to your entire hard drive then and they 
basically pull their stuff out of your video into your machine because you're running it, you're streaming it through uh, their site. And once that happens, you're infected. And once you're infected, then they have control over your machine and they can do whatever they want. So you got to be very careful in what you're doing online. Threats are becoming more uh, bigger and more complex. 390,000 new mal malware. It was uh, 80-some thousand in 2016. In 2017, it moved up to 390. Signature requires uh, samples. Uh, most malware variants infect 50 PCs or less. In other words, they go after the small, medium-sized businesses. And malware behaves differently in the wild. In other words, it's not just a virus. Virus protection by itself does not catch malware. As a matter of fact, 98% of all new malware is unique to a specific endpoint. It's rendering their signature-based virus protection almost obsolete because it's not uh, it's unique to that specific machine. It takes some of the uh, information from that machine to make itself unique so that virus protection can can get it. However, there is no this is the traditional virus protection. This is how it works now, and everybody here probably has that set up. You have a, a virus software that gets a signature from a remote update remotely every night, and that it runs a scan of things happen. The thing is, every single virus is becoming more and more unique. Hackers are becoming smarter, so hackers are becoming more aware, and they're changing their techniques. So we got to be more aware like they are and change our tools to be able to stop them. The new tools, the new virus protection, so... I'm telling you that maybe your virus protection is not where it needs to be and you need to upgrade. It's a machine learning behavior virus protection. So what that means is it learns how a virus reacts and it and then it stops it from actually happening even though it doesn't it's not in its definition. It learns that if, it, if the virus works in a specific way, it will put a rollback and auto remediation point so that if it's a virus, we can always go back right before it discovered it. And it works in a multi-vector protection. It looks at different ways. Not only does it look at the, the, the definitions that it has, but it looks at the function and the way the virus reacts or an application reacts. And if it reacts like a virus, it will stop it. So this is the new virus tech, uh, software out there. And the capabilities, that are, the tools out there are improving because the hackers are becoming smarter. Data loss. Uh, Nearly 7 million Dropbox passwords have been hacked. Uh, we can actually go in through the dark web. We have a tool that we use and put in uh, your domain name, and I can probably pull up a lot of people's passwords from the dark web because your data has probably been hacked from one of the services you've been using. So how much of your company's data is out there in Rogue? Do you know? Uh, it's something to be talk to, to, to really be concerned about. Uh, and most data loss, a lot of the data loss happens because of an inside job. 59% of them of employees steal properties, uh, proprietary corporate data when they quit or get fired. So what can we do to stop these people from taking your data when they leave? What can you do to protect your data internally, not only from outside threats, but from inside jobs? Bank fraud. We talked uh, that we said we we're going to talk a lot about bank fraud because uh, a couple of our clients have been re receiving uh, messages saying that, hey, uh, I'm just, it comes in as a fake email. So it comes in with the CEO's email address to probably the controller, and it says, please send, write a check for $5,000 and send it to that specific person. Some companies fall for it. Some companies, the CEO has to sign for the check, and, are, and they catch it before it becomes an issue. But FDIC does not protect you from bank fraud, and the bank is not responsible for getting your money back. So you have to be responsible for your money in the bank. 68% uh, of funds lost as a result of cyber attacks were de declared unrecoverable. So if somebody gets money from you because of cyber, uh, a cyber attack, uh, they own it. You can't get, you can't get to them. So I'm going to give you some tips on protecting yourself when it comes to the bank. This slide right here is worth uh, your time today, the hour that, we're, that you're spending with us today. And I truly appreciate you guys taking the time. But this is what I'd recommend for anybody in, that deals with 
a bank that logs into a bank account that does bank transactions. I would recommend having a dedicated PC for online banking and don't use the PC for accessing any other websites, period. No email access, no social media access, or no downloading of any files to that PC. This PC, it could be an old laptop that you haven't used in forever. Wipe it out, start fresh, and just have it dedicated for online banking alone. That will stop anything from happening to that laptop or that machine. And when you're done being online, turn it off. Because if it's off, nobody can hack it. And then sign up for email alerts from your bank whenever a withdrawal over 100 or 1,000 and you decide when that number has happened. So if a withdrawal automatically happens from your bank account, you need to be aware of it. And maybe it, and your bank can alert you when, that, when those happen. And then require your signature for any wire transfers because a lot of time uh, hackers will jump on, will know your username and password because they put some kind of a key logger on your machine and then you logged into your bank account. Now they cache your debt information. They log in as you on your bank account and they do a wire transfer. But if you require a signature and you have to go to the bank for the wire transfer, that request won't go through for them. And of course, have your money spread out in multiple accounts to minimize any risks. Four steps that I highly recommend you taking and putting in play right now to protect yourself and your bank account. It happens every day. I'm in the business of IT. I'm in the business of uh, protection and security, and I see it a lot more often than it needs to happen. Little things can happen that will stop this from becoming a, a bigger issue. Uh, the number six uh, is social media. Uh, if social media is a hacker's favorite target. They can get a lot of information out of social media. They get your name, your email address, your phone number. They do skip tracing, basically, on you before they, they decide they're going to hack you. 600,000 Facebook account, accounts are compromised every single day. And some stuff happens this way. It happens... Uh, this is a message that got received, and if you notice, the message says Facebook Mail. Well, Facebook Mail doesn't exist. Facebook.com exists. Facebook Mail does not. But this one basically says, uh, dear Facebook user, in an effort to make your online experience safer, basically, please log into your account. You click here to update your account information. Now, this is a fake, fake Facebook uh, website that you would go to that somebody created, and it looks real. And then you basically put your information, they capture it, then they can actually log into your account and, and get not only all your detail information, but all your contact detail information as well. So social media is also a significant loss of productivity. People all at work spend a lot of time on social media. Uh, 39% of employees spend an hour or less, 29% spend one to two hours, 21% two to five hours, 3% is 10 plus hours. I mean, uh, they're not working, but they're always online. It's an addiction, and it needs to be managed and controlled. And in a business environment, you have tools available to you to be able to stop them from going online. Some of our clients say, but I don't want to really be big brother. I don't want to stop them from being able to go Facebook to Facebook if they want to uh, just as long as they're working and they want to go online, I want to allow them to do that. There's tools where you could say, all right, is an hour enough? Because then we can limit them to be online for just one hour. Uh, there's other things to do uh, to make sure that you're getting the productivity you want and not being big brother, being seen by your employees as somebody that's a tyrant. Uh, this happened uh, with social media is dead PR. I mean, if, I don't know if you remember the scandal when the people at Burger King stood on top of the lettuce uh, and this is an employee, a Burger King employee, who took a picture of himself stepping in bins of lettuce, and he was ended up tracked down by users of the internet site that he posted it on, and he ended up getting fired. But if one of your employees takes a picture of something internally posted and say, my company that I work for sucks, well, guess what? Everybody that is followed him, and that could go viral, will affect you and give you bad PR. And the number, the, the last piece I'm going to talk about from a, a risk perspective is uh, mobile. Everybody's using their phone as if there are PCs now, nowadays. Uh, you have email on your phone and you have company data on your phone. We you also have personal data on your phone. So some companies are looking at us like, how do we protect our phones and our data? But we don't want, these phones don't belong to us. They belong to our employees. 
So the way to, to, to adhere this and to do this is to basically put what we call mobile device management. It encapsulates where your data is. And if your employee is no longer your employees, what we can do is selective wipe only your data and leave their pictures and leave their data. And we can act, cannot actually see anything on their device. We can only control your data that belongs to you. We could also auto wipe the device. We could geo track the device to find out where it is. There's a lot of things that we could do, but we cannot see your employees' personal data or messages or what have you, but we only are concerned with your company data. So mobile devices are becoming more and more of a threat. More, there's more viruses for them. There's more um, uh, hacks for them. Now, if you own an iPhone, it's a lot more secure than an Android. Now, I love Android because it's wide open. I'm an IT guy. So with Android being wide open, I, I have a lot more flexibility. But from a security perspective, Apple, because they are, uh, they, it's all in the Apple ec ecosystem. In other words, they control the servers, they control the devices and the software on it, unlike Android that only controls the, so the, the software. And then uh, somebody like uh, Nokia or Samsung or whatever else will put, We'll, all, we'll create the hardware so they're separate companies. Apple controls it all so it makes it more secure. And looking ahead, Internet of Things, meaning your bike will have uh, an IP, it will be connected, it will be smart. Your camera should be already be smart. Your washing machine, your dishwasher, your refrigerator, all those devices now are going to be remotely controlled. But they, because they're going to be remotely controlled, connected through your Wi-Fi to the Internet, they also call their security risk. And that's what we're looking for in, in technology uh, to try to protect you. We look at the gamut of things all together. So I've given you quite a bit of risks and the, the, the top seven things that you need to be aware of. So, so how do you protect yourself? What do you do now to make sure that you're secured and you're protected? We've created a multi-layered approach to security, and we call it the security umbrella, the cover everything underneath your network. Number one is uh, your cloud-managed desktop security, antivirus, anti-malware protection, USB device management. You could actually lock the USB ports on your, uh, com on your computer so that they cannot pull out data and take it with them. It's important to know that and be aware of it because it could be very handy. Or you can encrypt all your data because some of our clients will tell us, well, guess what? I still need to use USB devices. I want to move data from here to there, and I want to be able to be flexible. You can't tell me I can't use USB devices. If we encrypt your data, and with your data encrypted, it will, uh, on all the machines on your network, you could use a USB device and move data from one to the other because the decryption key is on all every single one of your machines. However, if one of your employees copies data on any USB device and takes it to a machine that does not have the decryption key, their own personal machine at home, they will not be able to open up those files. It will protect your data. Second layer is patch management. Patch management is one of the most important things you could do. Patch management, application management is basically updating your software to the latest version and any update that comes and patches that comes after that. The way hackers are able to work is that they go in and Microsoft will release a patch and say, hey, we found a vulnerability and this is how you're able to access it and this is how you can fix it. Well, hackers are betting on the fact that you will not be patching your devices. Now they know that there is a vulnerability and they know how they can access it. And but, but because you did not put the fix in place, they can actually use that uh, exploit to attack you. And that's how it works. So if you're patched regularly and all your windows are updated, your, well, not only windows, Adobe, Flash, Firefox, GoToMeeting, Shockwaves, log me in, and a, a, a ton more that requires updates and have exploits out there. If they're patched and you have the latest one, you protect yourself because hackers can't use those, that data anymore. Uh, so that's very important to know. The uh, third layer after that that we put together is uh, file auditing and secure login. Obviously, we recommend two-factor authentication on a network. 
uh, and you've probably used that in some websites or maybe your bank where it sends you actually a code that you have to, not only your username and password, but an, an additional code that you have to enter in. That's two-factor authentication. Uh, I we always recommend having Active Directory users. Active Directory is your domain, your network. Uh, everybody should have their own username and passwords. We create, we encrypt every data uh, and every hard drives and what we call data at rest. We also recommend having activity logging turned on so that every machine and every server and every device and every user, we have a log of everything that they're doing. That way, we're able to find out what happened if something does happen. And we're able to stop it before it becomes a bigger issue because we have a log that gets uh, looked at and reviewed. And we talked about cloud backup and uh, disaster recovery. It's important to have some of that, uh, to have it in place and to know what to do if there is an issue. The additional layer is mobile devices. And we talked about that a little bit earlier, but if you have mobile devices, where's your data in it? The recommendation is to have mobile device management and encrypt all those devices because they leave your environment, they go out there, and if you lose it or somebody becomes disgruntled, you wanna make sure that your data is secured and protected. So this is within your network. Now, uh, the door of your network, the, the, the gateway in is your firewall. And make sure you have a, a smart firewall, an enterprise level firewall that is that has web capability and web filtering capability that could do antivirus and anti-malware at its level before they actually hit Windows or any other machines that you have or servers that you have internally. That it does scheduled vulnerabilities and auditing and alerting to let us know if there is an issue. That it inspects every uh, traffic and every packet coming in and out of your network. That does IPS or intrusion prevention system. In other words, if it finds traffic that it, find, it sees that it could be malicious, it will block it, unless you go manually and tell it to allow that traffic to come in. We need to, to there is a difference between a $90 firewall that you buy at Best Buy and a $900 firewall that has all these capabilities built in, because it has more RAM, it has a better processor, and it has a lot more capabilities in it. So your firewall is very important, and I hope you test it and measure it and audit it and make sure that it's capable, capable for you. That's on your firewall. Right outside your network is the internet. But before you hit the internet, you actually hit DNS or domain name services. We recommend having a DNS filtering system in place. This is not an expensive solution, this is minimal. But what it does is it scans everything coming in and out before it actually comes to even your firewall. But it manages all the traffic coming in and out of your network onto the, to the internet. So it does comprehensive botnet and antivirus and anti-malware out there before it even comes to you. Tertiary, we talk about antivirus a lot and anti-malware, but it's important to look at all of them. It protects your device and users with an internet-wide policy, a DNS layer. So if you have this set up and somebody has a mobile device, like a laptop, and when they're in the office, they're secured and uh, Content filtering is working and what have you. However, when they go outside the office and they jump on Starbucks internet, now content filtering needs to be moving with them. And if you have an open DNS filtering in play, content filtering will move with that device. It does, they don't have to be internally to your network. And obviously it gives you a granular report that tells you how many uh, hackers did, uh, tried to come in, how many malware tried to come in, what did it stop, uh, what is your employees doing and, and what have you. And we can get into detail of that to explain to you what OpenDNS will do for you. But it's important to have that additional outside your network layer of security. Outside of that is your email and, uh, and spam. So make sure you have a strong spam firewall and protected email. Make sure that you encrypt all your email. So when you send data out that either is HIPAA or PCI or has some customer information that you don't want to share with everybody, send it encrypted, where they receive it as a message and they have a portal to go to on up their portal that they click on it, then they have to actually log into a user with a username and password to, to read your message. But if you're including some of your company's data that you don't want anybody else to see, make sure that you send it secure, especially if you're in healthcare. And make sure you have an inbound and outbound mail protection. 
And 99% effectiveness of blocking spam is where you need to be. So whatever spam engine you're using, make sure it's covered, uh, it, it's strong. And we talked about end user being the number one reason for breaches. So the one thing that we do tell you that to make sure that you train your people, train them on what to look for, train them on what to do, train them on, uh, on what I call good browsing or good internet browsing. Uh, Self-administrative web-based training is available out there. We will offer one for you. Uh, and what topics that it usually cover is what is a personal data and a personal ident identifiable information and personal data you, that you don't want to share with anybody, internal and external threats, any phishing scams out there, password management and how to deal with it, all the Wi-Fi dangers, bring your own device dangers. In other words, when you have your own cell phone and it has company data on it, clean desk policy, and a lot more stuff that we will be covering. End user training is key. Uh, so that's what we call a multi-layered approach to a complete security umbrella out there. In short, most people only have a firewall, antivirus, and anti-spyware, and they think they're protected. They are not. They're missing some very key components. This is a very important slide. This is a lot of, most people that we see are missing these components. Number one, encryption all hard drives. Make sure every device that you have has encryption set up on the hard drives, which means this. We put a, an encryption key, uh, like a bit lock or what have you. When your machine first boot up, it will ask you for a code before Windows boots up, and it encrypts your hard drive. Let's say you're out with the laptop and you, use, you, you, you lose your laptop. Just to let you know, 12,000 laptops are lost every single day. Uh, if you lose your laptop and your hard drive is encrypted, you lost a piece of hardware. That's it. You didn't lose any of your data. Nobody can get that data, even if they remove the hard drive out. If the hard drive is encrypted, the data is also encrypted, and they cannot take that data out. It's actually a law for HIPAA and PCI uh, regulations, so if you have to adhere to those, you have to have all your hard drives encrypted. If you don't, you're at default. The second piece is mobile device management. If you get email on your phone, if you send information back and forth uh, through text, make sure you have mobile device management solution of, uh, installed on your phone. DNS layer security, something that we see a lot of people that don't have, another layer that you should add. Uh, desktop management, which is basically USB locking, basically making sure that uh, people that have specific rights to specific uh, data and don't have rights to other data, that the rights are set up right, that the shares are set up right. All of that stuff between USB and shares, you need to make sure that that's set up right and test it on a regular basis. Um, patch management, we talked about that, but patch management is usually done manually or through the automatic Windows update. You should have an actual system running that updates your patches because it should update not only Windows, it should update Adobe and all the other uh, applications out there that we discussed earlier. But patch management system is important. And the last piece is monitoring and remediation. Uh, monitoring and remediation is basically somebody to look at all your traffic all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so that if there is an issue, you jump on it and become more proactive than wait when there is a problem, after there is a problem, and then try to put the pieces together. So these are some of the most important things, in short, that we see missing in most networks. We also, I would add on top of this is firewalls. A lot of the firewalls we see are um, are just too underpowered, and they don't have the right encryption or the right uh, security in place. So it doesn't do IPS, intrusion prevention system. It doesn't do some of the stuff that you want in place. So definitely audit your firewall. Make sure it's strong enough to handle the security that you need within your organization. So most people just have firewall, antivirus, anti-spyware, and the firewall is actually uh, too underpowered. So these are the, some of the stuff that you need to make sure that you have in place now. This stuff doesn't cost a lot. However, it protects you. The protection that you get out of it is, uh, is worth the price of admission. So bottom line, you just need to get serious about protecting your company against cyber crimes. So that's as important as, as, as anything that you do in your company. That's what keeps me up at night. Uh, 
I will add one other piece, and we talked about uh, backup and disaster recovery. You should know without any question if something happens to your servers, if you get hacked, what is your next step right away? Who do you call? What gets activated? How do you roll back? And how do you get working again right away? If you don't have a documented, written down policy and procedure for your backup and disaster recovery, you are doing yourself a disservice and you need help right away because that is going to allow you to be more secure. But if you're not secure, if somebody actually was able to come through after doing everything that we talked about, now that's your backup plan. This is what your policies and this is your procedure that you're going to follow to get you back whole in the shortest amount of time uh, allowed. So the three steps to protecting your organization is uh, in those in those specific, uh, the number one is threat assessment. So what's lacking in your security right now? How are your employees using your company-owned devices? What third-party cloud apps are you using? Are your system truly backed up? Were you exposed to a risk? Is there a risk happening right now that you're not aware of? Whose whose job is it to make sure your network is protected? And how do you know if you're do if they're doing their jobs? So number one that you need to do is a threat assessment, where we come in and truly assess your situation and run an audit of your entire organization and network uh, and your infrastructure to see where you stand. Then we create an action plan. Based on what was discovered, what do we need to do now to ensure our, that our systems, data, and operations are secure from thefts, compromise, corruptions, or et cetera? So you first you do the assessment, then you do the action plan, and then last is ongoing maintenance. We talked about uh, it's, uh, updates and patch management, and ongoing maintenance is not a set it and forget it approach to security because your hack your attackers aren't set it and forget it. Ongoing maintenance is to be able to monitor and remediate, and 24 hours a day look at the logs and everything that's happening on your network because that way. If there's a hacker trying to get in, you have somebody that can jump on and stop them. It's in the ongoing maintenance and updates that are very important. So the first step is free. Because you joined in today, the 23 uh, people that joined us today, at no cost to your publication, will come to your office and will conduct a cybersecurity evaluation where we'll perform an external vulnerability scan. So we'll try to hack you from the outside not even coming to your office from the outside will try to hack you. That will show us where your firewall and any internal vulnerability scans of all your network devices will, will come up. And what, what did we find? We'll give you a grade of your network. Uh, we'll report on open ports, on firmware vulnerabilities, on, on missing patches, on firewall misconfigurations, and so forth. We'll audit your company's internet usage and report on botnet activity, spyware, infection, what have you. We'll be able to tell you if you're able to go online and see porn or, or see gambling or terrorism or whatever it may be, job searches, you know, your employees spending time trying to find another job, are they doing that? We'll be able to come in and run a scan and tell you what they can reach and what they can't reach. During our first step, can they reach it or not, if we put some tools in place, did they reach it or not? And that's the difference. So then we check your network's backup and disaster recovery system to ensure it's working properly and accurately, backing up all your critical files and information, because uh, you never you never want to that that you never want to lose. So we'll do that for you. Uh, and then we we'll check computers and servers for spyware and rogue and malicious software installs. In other words, we'll scan your network to make sure to see if you have those issues or not, to see if you're already hacked or not. And uh, access overall security and data loss risk will run an overall network audit and will tell you exactly where your holes are, what needs to happen to make you secure. So we'll offer that for you for free. The second step is, uh, is also free, which was the security training we talked about. For all 23 people, all your companies and all your employees will provide you the free employee security training. I call it human security training. It's one of the most important things that you could do is to train your employees. So if you're interested in that, that alone is worth it because that's, we usually charge $500 for it. Uh, 
We will offer it to every single uh, person that logged in, that came in today. If you guys are interested, let us know. And what we'll do is give you a portal to log into, and then you'll be able to give it to all your employees for them to set up um, a training and go through it. The training takes about 45 minutes. They actually get an exam or a test at the end of it. So that way we make sure they paid attention during the training. And then they get a certificate that say that human security trained. And in that case, then you know you have at least giving them the tools and the knowledge to be aware of what's happening out there so they're not clicking left and right on everything that's out there. It's important to train your employees. And, and what to do now is if you are interested in pursuing that, if you're interested for us to come in and let you know where your network is, please email jstewart at mvpworks.com or call us at 630-1701 and we'll schedule your assessment for you. Uh, okay, we have 10 minutes left. Uh, so we're, let me see if we got uh, some questions. Uh, hold on one second. Let me look at the questions that got submitted, that got submitted to us uh, uh, from before. Okay, here's a question. Um, why is, is encryption that important? Okay, so uh, encryption is basically a key where uh, it's, a, it's a, a way for us to put a tool onto your hard drives that allows the drive to have, a, that requires to have a decryption key for you to be able to see the data. So if you're, and without the decryption key, and the decryption key comes into effect once you put in the code for for you to, to be able to start loading Windows for the encryption to come in. So, they, so then the machine knows that you're the right person. That, anybody else won't know that code. So anybody else that has your machine, your hard drive with them won't be able to, even if they take the hard drive out, be able to scan it and be able to get any of your data off of it. And it secures you completely. Um, okay, here's another question. Okay, so uh, this company is getting audited. Uh, and uh, they have an audit uh, coming from a bank uh, there in, uh, in collections, and uh, the bank requires a big piece of uh, an Excel spreadsheet to be filled out. They also require encryption on every hard drive. Okay, I'm just trying to get to the question. Um, okay, do we help with audits like this? Yes, yes we do. So if you are getting audited, if you have an Excel spreadsheet, whether it be in HIPAA related, whether being PCI related, we will also run a PCI scan for you. We will help you with a SOC audit. Uh, so if you need to be SOC, uh, if you have, to, if you want to be get an attestation letter for and be SOC, uh, SOC 16 or SOC 18 certified, we'll help you do that and we'll help you with the audit. Uh, so yes, we can help with that. Um, okay. Uh, I hope you everybody found uh, this helpful. I will unmute everyone. Uh, please feel free to shout them out. And uh, if not, uh, we'll wrap up uh, with five minutes to spare. Okay, I hope everybody found this beneficial. Thank you everybody for your time. We are we are we did record this uh uh this uh uh webinar and we'll have it available on our website under MVP University and some people that already registered and said they couldn't make it, we're gonna send you the uh the recording. Thanks for your time. We're always available to help out. We want it to be uh, a, a presentation that's very informative. I hope you found it uh, informative. I hope you found it beneficial. And um, we're always available for you. Any questions that to do with technology? Thank you very much, everybody, and have a great day. Thank you.